by your love I am accepted. You're a good and gracious King. Oh, what grace that you would see me as your child and as your friend safe secure in you forever i pour out my praise again you deserve the greater glory overcome i lift my voice of nothing empty handed I rejoice you deserve the greater glory overcome with joy I sing by your love I am accepted you're a good and gracious King. Holy, holy Lord Almighty, good and gracious, good and gracious, holy, holy Lord. the greater glory overcome I lift my voice to the king in need of nothing empty handed I rejoice you deserve the greater glory Overcome with joy I sing, by your love I am accepted, you're a good and gracious king. Thank so much, thank you so much. We have a good and gracious king, folks. We really do. We need to put that. God is with us, and he's with us. Who can be against us? We need to keep that in our minds at all times. Give each other a wave. Glad you notice. Glad to see each other, and uh, grab a seat. Oh, look at these ladies taking care of me, huh? Huh? See how I get served? I'm living the good life. Well, good morning and welcome again to Calvary Baptist Church here in Didham, Massachusetts, huh? We're in Didham, Dead Ham. What a crazy name that is. They should have stuck again with that original name Dedham was going to be. It was going to be contentment. Go back to like 1636, 1635. It was going to be contentment. Look it up. You can Google it. And it's true, but the whole legal battle went on. It went down downtown Boston. Always Boston messing us up, right? And, we came out dead. I'm named after that city over there in England. That's okay. But Jesus calling and our response is what we're going to be looking at today. Jesus calling and our response. Now, we've been out of the book of John for three weeks, folks. Three weeks. I don't know about you, but I forget a lot. Okay? I, I just do. So we're going to let a brief recap where we've gotten to in the book of John. Okay? It started off with Jesus as the eternal word. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. Right from the beginning, Jesus is God. And he became incarnate. That's an amazing thought. Jesus became the focal point of mankind, becoming physical like us. God, who was in the spirit, became flesh for us. It's an amazing thought. Can you figure this out for me? He set aside his glory. I can't articulate what that means. Can you? 
because we can't see God's glory, right? On this side of heaven, you can't see God's glory. And that's true. But he set it aside somehow. I don't know what that means. Whatever it means to you, I don't know what else to tell you. And he took on our form for us. That's just an amazing thought. You need to sit back and think about this. And then in John chapter 1, John the Baptist enters in, the baptizer. He, gets, he comes on the scene, okay? And what's happening? He's baptizing people for the, to repentance about sin. And he's not doing it in Jerusalem. He's doing it over in the wilderness by the Jordan River. It's crazy. Crazy. Take a 40-mile hike to go get dunked in water. But I guess that sin was really, really apparent to them. We need to see our sin. We need to see our sin. You know, like in The Wizard of Oz, right? Remember? What's behind the, the wizard was behind the curtain, right? Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. But you kind of need to. The curtain needed to get drawn back, and the wizard was exposed. He was. So Jesus is baptized by this reluctant baptizer, John, right? Did, I can't baptize you. John, you're going to do this now. Let's get on with this, right? He had to do his job. And Jesus immediately goes into the wilderness for 40 days of prayer, of fasting, and temptation of Satan. It's just an amazing thing. That information is in the Synoptic Gospels. It's not in John. That's okay. After 40 plus days, Jesus returns. What is John when he returns? He says, Behold, the Lamb of God is coming. It identifies who Jesus is right from the beginning. And that brings us up to now where we are today of Jesus coming again to John the baptizer and his disciples. That's what we're going to pick up in John chapter 1 and verse 35. It says, again, the next day John stood with two of his disciples, looking at Jesus as he walked and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. Okay? And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned, seeing them following, he said to them, What do you seek? And they said, Rabbi, which is to say, which is to say when translated, teacher, uh, where are you staying? And he said to them, come and see. Come and see where I'm staying. And they came and they saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. And now it is about the 10th hour. So that's what we pick up here. That's what we pick up. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word, Lord. There's so much information that, that's here, Father. Uh, if, you, if, if you could just help us discern it, Lord, today, clear my mind and heart so I can present what's necessary, Lord, uh, for this message. I thank you and I praise you, Jesus. Amen. Is, 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 that, is, that, is the door open? Could you check the door, in, uh, Dan, for me? I think it might be open so people aren't distracted by those kitties downstairs. Or, Oh, they're out there. Oh, that's cool. Oh, they're up. That's cool. Come on in. I just didn't know. Come on in. Didn't realize. We can do anything. So we're going to get into this message. I want you to keep in mind the calling and the response as we look at these verses today and next week, okay? The calling and the response, okay? Because this is a repeat. In verse 29 earlier, the same thing gets said, Behold the Lamb of God, right? Same thing. Now we're seeing this again in verse 37. Behold the Lamb of God. It's a different day, but it's the same Savior, right? Behold the Lamb of God. Jesus is identified as the Lamb of God again by John the Baptist. But in that statement that he made, right, something transpired. Behold the Lamb of God. Because there's not a lot of information given in that, is there? Not a lot's given. Behold the Lamb of God. But some truths were revealed in that. I really do believe that. The truth is that John identified Jesus, and they knew, and the disciples knew, right, that he was the Lamb of God. Because let's remember, John is out in the wilderness baptizing people for the repentance of their sin. Let's keep in context of what's going on here. Okay, well, it's not just, let's not just jump to the calling of the disciples. They're out there being, being baptized for the repentance of sin. That's the focal point here. It really is. In coming to Jesus to hear his calling, we need to see the sin that's before us in our lives. That's what we need to do, I think. Isn't that what the call of repentance is all about? To see our sins. Now, truth. Truth, okay? And when you're presented with the truth, you know what the truth is. You just do. Sometimes don't you know what the truth is? Sometimes what more needs to be said than the simple truth? Oh, you, you, you hear the truth, right? 
What's that? We, we want more evidences, more information, more of this, more of that. You know it's the truth. What more needs to be said? What more needs to be said? Yeah, that same thing would happen. I mean, think of you, if a house is burning, right? That house is on fire, right? There is, no, is there any house on fire? And the truth of it is, you need to get out. So when a firefighter comes and they go to you, hey, this way, there's the window. Let's get out the window. There's a ladder outside. We need to get out, right? That fire makes the truth all the more emphatic, doesn't it? There's one way out, isn't there, when it's a fire? There's one way out. I said, cool, that picture of that shadow of that first responder there. I imagine someone photoshopped it, but it's still, it's just as cool. There's one way out. That's the truth. It is the truth. What else needs to be said? What more evidence do we need? No, I think there's another way out. Really? There's another way out of the burning house? Are we going to debate this? Are we going to debate this? Argue against the fire and you'll lose, right? That's, we know this. We know this. I'm not going to stand here and pretend how or why to explain the, to explain the debate and, and, and negation people have of, the word, of truth. I know I negated the truth for so long before I came to Christ. I read this today in a devotional that I was looking at. It says, the man that has been made obtuse by sin will say he has no conscience of sin. Sin will put you to a place that I don't even know what sin is, right? I read that this morning, and I was thinking about that. I don't think that worked with fire, because you know what fire is. If you don't get out, you're going to die. So metaphorically speaking, okay, these two disciples that were in this text, they basically saw the window, didn't they? When Jesus came along as the, as the Lamb of God, they saw the window, and they ran for the window. The truth was right in front of them. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, okay? Life everlasting. Not a good life of just luxury. Not that. No, no, no. No, the, the Lamb of God is ever-present as well. That's what we need to remember now, today. Waiting for souls to step away from the fire, to the window, to the ladder, to get out. Because the house is burning. This is what we don't want to realize. We are all going to die one day. We get this fictitious thought in our minds that we're going to live forever. It's not what happens, and we know this. We know this. We're condemned already by our sin. And that's really not popular, is it? To say that in the world, I am a hateful person. No, I'm not. I'm a loving person. I want you to know you're condemned already, and there's a way to get out of this fire. I'm actually pointing you out to safety, okay? That's my goal. That's my job. The Word of God tells us to do this. That, oh, this other disciple, there's two disciples here, James, I mean, uh, uh, a, uh, Andrew and the other disciple. Just as you go through the book of John, that, and I believe in this case, this other disciple probably was John. The only reason you, you say this is because John never identifies himself in the gospel that he wrote, okay? He never, he's, he's referred to as the one whom Jesus loved. So most likely this was John with Andrew and John. But if it wasn't, it's a disciple. So there's some things, and people will argue over these things about who it is that's really not important, is it? It's a disciple. It's a follower is all that matters. The label, the person, really isn't that important. I'm not that important. You're not that important. Christ is important. So these two disciples, what are they doing? They're waving goodbye to the baptizer. They're saying hello to Jesus. They heard who Jesus was in a heartbeat, and they went there. They saw no signs, and they saw no miracles. Keep that in mind as we go through this. They just heard John the Baptist say, Behold the Lamb of God. That's all, that's all I'm reading. I didn't read anything else. And they went. And Jesus turned and asked them, right? They're following. What do you see? What do you want? What do you see? Think about that for a minute. Can I help you? Do you think maybe it was an awkward moment? The Lamb of God turns around and says, What do you want? What are you seeking? Put yourself in their position, because I was thinking this through. It really would be an awkward position to be in, I think. I think I'm, I think I'm getting so awkward with my, my microphone. But Jesus is, is omniscient already. He knew their hearts. He really did. And think, Jesus had great intel, if you will, information on these two guys. Why do I say that? Just think for a moment. These two disciples, they were disciples of John the Baptist. 
John the Baptist had a mission. He was one, he was one crying in the wilderness, making straight the way of the Lord, okay? And he was preaching to people to repentance, to repentance that's so important. He's fulfilling this prophecy, prophecy. So there's two things I think we can say that we would know about Andrew and John here, right? First, they're convicted of their sins. They're convicted of their sins, and they sought forgiveness that only Messiah could bring. And of course, John is preparing the way for Messiah. It's interesting how it actually all dovetails together quite, quite well. John's mission, John's mission was this, to getting people out, uh, out to repent of their sins, right? And to make straight the way of the Lord, of the Messiah. These two followers of John, they, they, they were out there already. They already were repentant, if you will. They were repentant and they were his disciples. They were actually working with John the Baptist, doing the job. They were actively seeking the kingdom of God. Jesus says, what are you seeking? What are you seeking? It sort of challenges their motives, doesn't it? What are you seeking? Do you ever have your motives challenged on what you're going to do on something? What do you want? Hey, guys, this isn't a popularity contest. Are you here to follow John or follow me? What's happening? And that wasn't the whole point of it all. No. What are you seeking? What do you want from life? You know that commercial used to be around? What do you want from life, guys? What are you looking for? Probing questions are healthy. They are. They can make you uncomfortable. Probing questions sort of like the Wizard of Oz. It, it, it tells you what's behind that curtain where the wizard is. Right? Probing questions. They pull that curtain back, don't they? Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. No, maybe we should. Maybe we should. You know, to ask probing questions, you need to, you, you, you need to earn the right to do that, OK? If you come at people too hard right up front, walls go up. Walls go up. That's what happens. We need to earn the right to do that. But when I have the opportunity, and that lays before me, I ask a question. And this is one of the questions I've asked. I've, you've heard me say this before, and, and, and I hope You'll put it to heart. I'll ask him, if you were to die tonight, and you were to stand before God, and God was to ask you, why should I let you in my heaven, what would you tell him? Interesting question. Note in that question that I'm irrelevant. I don't have anything to do with that. If I ask that question to any one of you, you then are having a dialogue between God and you. I am not part of that conversation. And that's the truth of this, folks. I can't save you. No one can save each other. It's all of God. It's so important for us to keep this in mind. Keep this in mind. I'm irrelevant in this. Do I care enough to ask sometimes? It can be hard. I can get in the way. Have I earned the right to do this? Have I built a relationship to do this? What are you seeking? I don't know that people know what they're seeking. I think as we live so much of the time, we're, we live very, in a very reactionary manner in our life. This happens, so I do that. This happens, so I do that. And as I ask that question, I understand I'm not Jesus, right? John the Baptist said he's not the Christ. He made it clear. We are, we are called to call to point people to Christ, to shed light on their path, right, on the way they're going to go. Do you remember what they were called in the book of Acts, the first Christians? They were called people of the way, people of the way. They were called that because they changed from their way and they went to God's way. They repented. It's so important for us to keep this in mind, to keep this in our minds. I think when Jesus asked this question to Andrew and John, they were intimidated. This, think of the situation, the Lamb of God. They understood who he was, apparently, because they just left John the Baptist and went right to him. They were asked, what do you seek? Okay. And in and, and, and doing that, how did they answer? I think the answer was like this. Uh, 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 Rabbi, where are you staying? That's the way I would be. Are you going to be bold? No, this is the Lamb of God. This is the Lamb of God. You see, Jesus was meek. Jesus was gentle. Jesus was powerful. Jesus' voice calmed the storm. Okay? That example was put down for us, that miracle, so, us could see his, so we could see his power. It also saved the guys in the boat. All right? It really did. He's extremely powerful. So that question of where you're staying culturally would, have been, culturally would have been very, very significant. It wouldn't just be a pleasantry. 
So it's a different culture. You had to open your homes to other people. It was a matter of survival. You would open your home to someone else because you might be someplace uh, in another place and you need a home open to you. It's different societally than how we live now. I'm not saying they never locked their doors, but they locked their doors different than us. I really think that they did. Out of survival. Jesus says to come and see. They came and they saw where Jesus was staying and they stayed with him. It says it was about the 10th hour, right? So if you get to the 10th hour of the day, it means it's going to be dark soon. They had no LED lighting, okay? When it got dark, it got dark, okay? If you didn't have moonlight, you had no light. They went and they stayed with him. They went to stay with him. And there's nothing wrong with wanting to be with Jesus, is there? That's what we should want. Shouldn't that be our desire to want to be with Jesus? I think they stayed with him. And as they stayed with him, Jesus, because he knew their hearts, he then filled their hearts, their minds, with a uh, few more words. They were with him. He was pouring things into their lives. Remember it says in the Bible, if all the things that Jesus did were, were, were accounted for one by one, the books would fill up the earth. That's always such an amazing thing that people get into theological arguments over stuff that Jesus did. When we are just, this book seems thick. It just scratches the surface of what he did. If we could just do what's in here, we'd really be cooking with gas, as the expression goes. It really would be a lot. It really would be a lot for us there. But, uh, and as well, Jesus knew that they were honest and sincere seekers. Remember, they've already been convicted of their sin. They're convicted of the sin. You know, in the Old Testament one time, Jesus was speaking, I mean, God was speaking to his people, and they were in idolatry in the book of Deuteronomy. And he was going to tell them how they were going to come out of, uh, out of, out of idolatry in there. And he says to them in Deuteronomy 4.29, he says, But from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you seek him with all of your heart and with all of your soul. That's how we're to seek God. See, these pe God's people were seeking after idols before this, the idols of our hearts. And that needed to change. The idols of our hearts need to change. See, because God doesn't change. God changes us. We need to be amenable to God's change to us. Because we're now outside the burning building. That picture is up there. You are. There's a house. It's burning down, right? It's on the outside. Do you go back into the burning building? You don't. That old life, we need to leave it behind. We need to leave the old life behind us. We can't reach back to it. We need to repent from it. This is what John the Baptist is doing. Repentance is turning away from your sin and walking away from it. If there was a fire like that, I'm pretty sure you'd walk away from it, right? The heat would be so intense. We need to think of our sin that way. We really do. And we don't need to go around after we've repented in sackcloth and ashes. I'm just such a bad person. I'm a bad person all the time. No, that's not repentance. That isn't repentance. If I've repented, I'm going to have joy in my heart. I need to have joy in my heart. That's what's there. That's what it is. Leave the sin behind. And another example, the sincerity in a person's heart, how it's exemplified. Jesus was speaking at, at, at the Passover in Jerusalem at one point, right? He's speaking to the people. A crowd was out there. And Jesus, and this is what it says in John chapter 2. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. When they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men. And he, knew no, he, and he had no need that anyone should testify of him for he knew what was in a man. Jesus knows our hearts. These people, they believed in Jesus' name when they saw the miracles, but something was missing. When we see things, sometimes you believe it, but something was missing, and that missing was trust. Belief and trust are two different things. They really are. And it tells us in James 2.19, it says, You believe there is one God, you do well. The demons believe and tremble. That's quite a difference, isn't there? Quite a difference. See, belief is intellectual. We believe certain things. Trust, you know what trust is? Trust is the, this thing we do with our children when they're little. For some reason, they, we get them up on chairs or counter, counters, right? And we teach them to jump into daddy's hands, right? We do this. This is crazy. We do this. And we catch them, and they just laugh and giggle. And then one day, they're up there doing that, and 
Daddy's down here getting the trash. And it's like, Daddy! And you turn around, and there's the little one in midair coming at you. You know why? Because they implicitly trust you all the time. It was not the best thing to teach them. But that's trust. They just assume Daddy's going to catch them every single time. That is trust. And these people, they didn't have it. I want you to think for a moment of Andrew and John. They left everything they had to follow Jesus. They trusted. See, they actually understood better than we do that all the stuff doesn't matter. Let it burn down in the house. We need to be more like them, right? Do we sacrifice anything? In this world, in the history of humankind, of us created in the image of God, Materialistically speaking, we have more than any other people that have ever existed. I can't imagine, uh, you know, anyone having this. I know you said, well, the Egyptians, they had the pyramids, yeah, but they didn't have air conditioning. No, we got it, baby. We got it all. We really do. But God knows our hearts. It's always a matter of the heart. At that Passover, they witnessed signs, right? But Jesus had no need for them to testify. The signs that they saw with their eyes and the words that they heard did not result in changed hearts. Did Jesus fail? Isn't that kind of funny? Did Jesus fail? The house is burning. That's the reality of it. Why don't the people get out? Why don't we get out? Jesus knew their hearts. Remember, Andrew and John, they saw no signs and miracles. They just heard the Lamb of God, and they went. No signs, no miracles that I can see recorded there. We continue on in our text in verses uh, 40 to 42, it says, and one of, the, one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And and they brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You should be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. So we get here now. They spent a very short time with Jesus. But a major transformation has taken place. Remember when when they first, when Andrew first saw him, he called him rabbi, which is teacher. In two verses, overnight, when he goes to his brother, Right? He says, we have found Messiah. There's, no, there's nothing higher, folks. These are Jews. There's nothing higher. This is Messiah. Okay? We know later on the religious leaders didn't get it, but James and, I mean, uh, Andrew and John got it. Right then, we have found Messiah. This is quite a statement. It's so when the truth is presented to you, why fight it? Why be there? The title changed. How do we respond to God's leading in our lives. You know, what we see here happening with Andrew is a wonderful pattern or practice being revealed to us regarding being a disciple. A disciple is a follower, but they're also a witness called to testify of who Jesus Christ was. Andrew was the first witness for Christ. He witnessed to his brother, Peter, right from the beginning. Andrew had to tell Peter who Jesus was. He had to tell him. And isn't that true of every new believer? Think about it for a moment. When you came to Christ, wasn't it essential to share your newfound knowledge with whoever you came in contact with? You were just bursting, weren't you? I was. We really didn't know anything when we came to Christ, but we just knew he was our Savior. That's all that mattered. We didn't know anything, but we felt like we knew everything. That ain't bad. That's the spirit working in your life. I recall as a young lad working in the lab, right? There I am. I'm working over in Watertown on Arsenal Street, okay, at the Army Materials Mechanics Research Center in Building 39 on the fifth floor with a view out over the Charles River. I remember. And there I am after I've been called, I've come to Christ. There I am in the lab. And, and I'm doing this analysis. doesn't make any difference what it's called. It doesn't, it's an acronym. I'm tired of the acronyms of my life. But there I am, I'm in the lab, and I've got this orange crystal in my hand. It's made of, it's, called, it's a thallium bromide. It's really pretty. 
and I'm polishing it on this thing like you would polish a, a stone or something, and I'm polishing it like this. And you know what I'm doing? Singing. I got that joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in, I'm only one to laugh. Down in my heart. I was doing that. I can see that in my mind right now. That's what I was doing. Polishing a thallium bromide crystal with very, very poor personal protective equipment on. It was a different era. <laughs> Trust me, it was. But my point is, you're bursting with it. You just have to tell people. There was no one in the lab with me. It didn't make any difference. I had that joy down in my heart because of the calling of Christ. The spiritual transformation it manifests itself in, in, in how we witness to others. It cannot be a secret. They're coming to Christ. These people were coming to Christ. They were seeing their sin when they came to see John, didn't they? To repent of their sin. When we're faced with sin and we see it, it can be uncomfortable to put it politely, isn't it? Is sin polite? I don't think so. We, call, we, we treat it so politely, don't we? Sin is nasty. It is nasty. You know, it's this. How often do we hear, say, well, you know what? You just need to come to Jesus, pray him into your heart, and you'll be saved. That sounds good, doesn't it? It's not. Because that by itself, it needs to be preceded by something. We need to come in to reality that we have sin in our lives. We really do. We really do. If a person's confessing with their mouth and believing in their heart, are they dealing with that sin? Or are they just looking for a dose of goodness? Because the world will give that to you. That's like the old Mary Poppins song, right? Just a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. Are we just trying to make it all feel good? Sin doesn't make it feel good when it comes and you get to the reality of it. And it's candy coated everywhere, literally put behind a curtain. And we can do it in our minds. We can, we can, we can, we can compartmentalize in our minds, can't we? And it shouldn't. It shouldn't. Coming to the Lamb should convict us of sin. Convicted is found guilty. Convicted. It's an admission of sin. There should, there's no lawyer in the courtroom that's representing you saying, no, Your Honor, my, my, my client pleads not guilty. No. Guilty. Convicted of sin. We need to be convicted of sins. John's ministry was making people aware of their sin. If a person doesn't realize they're a sinner, what's the point? Could you tell me? Why come here today? Why bother? Out of duty? Duty to who? To pee? Give me a break. <laughs> to God? God doesn't need that duty unless it's reverent worship and repentance of our sin. Because God wants our hearts, folks. He wants our hearts. He really does. And, and, and Matthew chapter 1, remember when the angel Gabriel came to Joseph to tell him who Jesus was, he told them he has come to save his people. Jesus' disciples are his people. That's what Jesus came, to save them from their sin. Sin's the operative word in Jesus' coming, the Lamb of God. If there was no sin, he would not have had to come. Am I right? They think of this for a moment, okay? I'll be done soon, but think of this for a moment. If a doctor came to me and he said, you know what, Pete? I know you probably know this, but I just got to tell you, you got cancer. You don't get long to live. And they said it to me like that. I think I'd have a problem with that doctor. Don't you? I'd have a real problem with him. The casualness, the superficiality. Because if you tell me I have cancer, I'm going to pause. You know, like the movie The Matrix where everything's going to. Yeah, that's what happens. If you're told that, that's what cancer would do to you. That's what it would do. It's like me standing here and saying, hey, you know, we're all sinners. It's all good, isn't it? At least we're all in the same boat. Isn't that superficial? Isn't that? As I, as I say that, it bothers me. I, it's all cool. We're all sinners. Just pray to Jesus. Well, you do need to pray to Jesus. We need to repent. 
Does my sin make me pause? That's what I'm getting at. Because the cancer would. Does my sin make me pause? How about you? If it doesn't make me pause, what kind of a disciple am I? What's my response? Think of Andrew and John. They're out in the wilderness with John the Baptist, ministering to strangers. Do you think about that for a moment? This wasn't their neighbors. This isn't us. This is to, these are strangers coming from Jerusalem to the Jordan River, being baptized for the sin. They didn't know who they were. The reality of sin brought repentance to these people. These two guys gave their very best to God. Their very best to God. Just think of what they were doing. What they were doing was an amazing act of love. They were receiving nothing for this, were they? I thought about their actions. Think about their actions, what was happening, what they were doing. It was amazing to me. This passage is about the calling of the disciples in the context of what John was doing. And sin was central. Jerusalem was coming out to the Jordan River to repent of their sins. I thought about this. It's when's the last time you were on your knees about your sin? I was thinking about that. Think about that myself. And I had a hard week. I had a hard week this week. It was, it was just hard. I don't know how to put it to you. I stand up here. I'm, I'm, I'm very transparent when I'm up here. I had a hard week to me. It just this was there. Think about yourself. Did you have any anger this week? There was a lot of anger going around. Did you have anger? I had some. What did I do about it? How about pride? Were you prideful? It's a funny thing about pride, right? So you get rid of pride. We need to humble ourselves. We need to get humility. It's so easy after we get humble. After we gain that humility, isn't it? We have, we have, we have healing. But pride enters in. What about selfishness? Yep, I'm going to skip selfishness. I can't deal with that one. Okay, let's, let me move on to some other things I got here. How about, what about the lack of caring for others? We tend to gl gloss over that, don't we? The lack of caring for others. Because it's easy to do. You know what happens? Lack of caring for others? I just didn't know. I just didn't know. I, I would have done something. You know, sometimes we don't know. But we need to take care that we don't live our lives in such a way that we won't know. You see that difference there? Because I can live my life that way. I can come here, do these little messages, and not be in contact with any of you. Not knowing your pain and suffering. We can do it to each other. We aren't called to do that. We're called out of sympathy. Hey, look, folks, I'm just sharing you with how I sin right now, OK? Maybe you're more creative. But that's, that, you got a little snapshot of Pete, of his anger, his pride. I won't touch my selfishness. Can't deal with that one right now. But does our sin bring us to our knees? Does it buckle us ever? You know, Andrew and John, they were came to John the Baptist because of sin. And they went to Jesus, the Savior, not to be saved from starvation. Hey, they weren't worried about drowning. That happened to Peter later, right? When he lost his faith? No. They came because of sin. Sin. We need a physician. We need a physician. That's what it tells us in Luke chapter 5. It says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. We go to the doctors when we're sick, don't we? Makes sense. It says those who are righteous don't need a physician. Those that think they're righteous are very, very foolish. Very foolish. And I believe there's a lot of foolish people running around our society right now. And I don't want them to be foolish. That's not what I mean. I mean the reality is that I am righteous. I am righteous because of Christ. My, any righteousness I have is Christ imputed onto me, not because I'm a good guy. Ooh, I'm a good guy. Define that for me, please. I'd really like to hear a, an accurate description of that because I'll shoot holes in every single one of them. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about Christ. Jesus came for sinners. Sinners are called, right? Like Andrew and John. They came for repentance. Jesus came for his disciples. Jesus makes disciples. You know, cancer is a sickness that spreads in our body, doesn't it? Maybe it's one cell with some weird genetics that goes crazy. Maybe a xenobiotic chemical enters into our body, messes up the genetics. You know, those xenobiotics are called carcinogens. And it causes the cells to go crazy. And a cancer is created, doesn't it? 
The cancer assumes control of all the cells in your body or that organ, and it grows and it grows. It expands its territory. It can become systemic. You know, cancer and sin have amazing parallels. Successful cancer growth results in the death of the body that it preys on. Did you ever think of that? Successful cancer kills its host. Isn't it a strange thought? It just is to me. Sin results in the spiritual death of a soul, of its body. Cancer and sin. Their eradication is necessary to have life and have life more abundantly. Isn't it? You still want to go on. Powerball will not give you an abundant life. Sorry. Those things that get put into your life from Powerball, they're going to get burnt up one day. We have no perfect cures for cancer. We have chemo. We have radiation. We have surgery. We have gene therapy and more are coming. That's great. I, you know, in my lifetime, I could, be, I could be impacted by cancer. It can happen. But when we're sick, we know we go to a doctor, don't we? No, the calling of these disciples was based on nothing in them. There's nothing the disciples did. Okay? Jesus said, come and see. Jesus invited them in. It's his calling. Jesus is calling. The question is, how are we responding? Are we giving our best, like Andrew and John did? Would we go to the wilderness for strangers? That's quite a thought, isn't it? For strangers. Am I repentant of my sin? Am I Christ-like because of his forgiveness, like Andrew and John? What am I sacrificing for those that have no repentance in their heart? So as I thought of this text today, how prevalent sin really is and how sin really gets ignored in many circles. I would like us to just think about that as we, how sin can enter in. But the beauty is the victory that we can have over it. This is the incredible thing about the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can repent, move away from it, and get away from it. Get away from that fire, that sin, and live life and life so abundantly. I just want to press it on your heart. We are called to be disciples we're going to look at this calling next week, and we're going to look at the challenges, the real challenge we have sometimes is being called as a disciple, because there are. Remember, I was real excited when I came to Christ at first. You cool down a little bit sometimes, huh? We're going to talk about that and about what it really means to be a disciple. Let's pray. Lord, I do thank you for this day, Lord. I thank you for your goodness, Father, to us. You are good to us all the time, Lord. Father, you said your only begotten Son, that whosoever believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Ah, we know these verses, Lord. Help us to take them to heart, Lord, to see our sin, reject it, and follow you. We we'll thank you and praise you, Jesus. Amen. And amen. Oh, all right. Y'all. So, 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 it's amazing when you're up here sometimes and everyone's got their masks on. I never know if you're happy or sad what I'm saying. I, I, I just go with it. What am I going to do? Sometimes I get the squint in the eyes. It's all right. Hey, but I'm going to, so the offering plates are up here. You know, feel free, you know, to, to, to put, put your offering in the, in the plates or do it online. Uh, there's, the, there's the address to do it online. That's what's there. Just a couple of things I want to mention to you. I put out an email this week, and if you didn't get it, let me know. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a webinar that's going to be this Tuesday and I think next Tuesday. It's called The Secret Life of Tween, Teens and Tweens. So as a church, I, I, I attend the Dedham Organization of Substance Awareness. I mean, we're a member of that. I mean, a member. I don't know what that means. I go and, I'm, and I want to be of utility to, the, to, to, to the, uh, our, our community. And uh, so this is a, 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 a consultant with teens and, and youth. Been doing this for years. And allegedly, he's had some wonderful information that comes through this for relational purposes for us between uh, across generationally. So. Uh, and I did notice this. I, I, I went to it on my computer, and I tried to log in, and I could not. And Carrie tried. She could not. Carrie told me she could, get her, she could register on her phone. And I did the same thing. So I, I'll put an email out to remind people of that. So if you can't register, which I was really getting ticked, <laughs> okay, it was grayed out. I said, come on. Uh, and Carrie's just smarter than I. And she told me, well, try it on your phone, Pete. And it worked. So I keep that in mind. It's there. Men's study. We have men's study tomorrow night, correct? 
Yes, we have men's study tomorrow night. Please join us, guys. Please join us. It'll be good. And I think it'll be next Sunday. Uh, Violette will be back and stuff. That we're going to pack the barrels going to Haiti. So we have two barrels. I think we have more than two barrels worth of material. So uh, we're going to do the best we can. I just want you to know that uh, we have neighbors here bringing us over stuff to go to Haiti. Okay? We have people coming to the church bringing us stuff to go to Haiti. I, was, I just, it's a wonderful feeling. And, and I just want you to know, first time I ever had this happen to me. I was out blowing snow, having a good time the other day. And, you know, it, it was going well. And one of the neighbors is still buying a pickup truck. And he, go, and he rolls the window. Hey, Pastor, you need any help? His name is Pete. He's not here today. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find him. I'm going to see him. I'm going to put stuff on, uh, something on his truck. But it was the first time one of the neighbors ever came out and he offered to help. It stopped me in my tracks, just so you know. Everything hits all of us differently. This one stopped me in my tracks. What a wonderful testimony it was for us as a church, you know, that the neighbors finally come wanting help. It just got me. So that, that thought in mind, it was so good. I'll not go on. But we should sing ourselves out, don't you think? Oh, and, and uh, we're going to see how many people here. We're going to do a junior church meeting. If there aren't a lot of people here, we'll have to postpone it. We'll see what that is. I'll check with a few of you because uh, a lot of people are out. I don't want to just, I don't want to have a meeting for the sake of a meeting. You know what I mean? It needs, it needs to be, the meeting needs to be meaningful. Well, that's trying to say that once, twice. It's hard. But with that, let's stand and, let's, and, and praise team. Come sing us out, please. the King, all glorious above, oh gratefully sing His wonderful love, our shield and defender, the Ancient of Days, pavilion in splendor and girded with praise. Oh tell of His might, oh sing of His grace, whose robe is the light and canopy space. Of wrath and big thunder clouds form, and dark is his path on the winds of the storm. You alone are the matchless king, to you alone be all majesty, your glories and wonders. 